Why do we tell stories? Stories are how humans uh, deliver the most important messages in life. Uh, and uh, I'm here to make another such delivery to you. Humans have uh, created uh, a marvelous world uh, of, of global connection, uh, a great giant network that we think of as the world system and often call globalization. The difficulty, however, is that this world is perishable. And when I say perishable, I'm not talking about survival of the species, but rather, and here is the moment 150,000 years ago where humanity all, almost went out. Uh, because of climate change, uh, human beings were reduced uh, anthropologists have estimated to uh, what they call to about 600 of what they call uh, breeding individuals. So all of us are from those 600 people who gathered uh, and clung to existence uh, at a place called Pinnacle Point in South Africa, right by the shore. And humanity apparently adapted and survived the uh, the stress by learning how to eat shellfish. So I'm not talking about this. I'm talking, uh, and you can see how they migrated from B down there. I'm talking about a different kind of crisis. The crisis that uh, we face with civilization itself and the world network that we glory in, uh, the uh, magnificent edifice of, of a globalized world. And what um, I have noticed is that there were four times in history, meaning since people have learned how to write stories, there have been four times where the world system, such as it was at the time, literally came apart and subsided. And uh, I wanted to know why and how that happened. And the best way I could do that was to gather a group of students and create a course, which I did. I've taught it three times. And the overriding uh, puzzle or riddle is whether or not this could happen again and how it would happen. Are there elements that tie these global crises uh, that we've experienced since the end of the Bronze Age are there elements that tie it together? And uh, this is the world of, of the Bronze Age. Are there elements that we can look to that um, are, are replicated in each of these crises? And uh, there's also the fact, which we know is a fact because we can look outside or look at each other. And that fact is that these uh, world systems uh, eventually came back together. They survived and revived. So part of the issue is not simply how could a crisis happen, but how would we, uh, how would we find resilience to put things back together? Uh, this instance took a couple hundred years or more, the so-called Dark Ages at the end of the Bronze Age, and uh, writing was lost in the Aegean area. The migration of peoples was a big part of it, and the, the second of these um, giant crises was the celebrated fall of the Roman Empire, as it's known. And uh, this also had a, a, a migratory element, and perhaps the strongest force uh, was climate change. Climate change bringing the great Justinianic plague that overthrew the Mediterranean world. The migrations of 
of uh, Germanic people, and then eventually the surge of Islam. Then there was the a great calamity of the 14th century, the Black Death. And uh, in uh, just a, a short few years, 40% uh, of uh, humanity uh, died. And the great globalized Eurasian network here that was completely interlinked came apart. And it stayed apart for another 300 years. But, of course, it eventually came back together. Then we have the crises of the 20th century, the two world wars and the depression. And uh, the system came apart, and it, it came back together. But if you were to look at the world, say, in 1940, after the Hitler-Stalin pact, you could uh, feel, much like Orwell did in 1984, that the world could be permanently divided into broken regions and that the idea of a system at all would have uh, disappeared. So the, the, the issue, I thought, was an issue of massive external force. And the externality that, that happened again and again was climate change, bringing war, pestilence, and, and famine. And yet, with my students, uh, teaching it three times, they helped usher me through a, a passage of transformative thinking, which came as a, a surprise to me. I discovered that the, uh, the climate change component was there and, and could act as a trigger just as a war could unseat uh, a system. But the thing that happened, that stood out in all of these historical cases, was that the system stopped working when people stopped believing in the very idea of civilization and its leadership. Leadership and the elites lost authority and ultimately were overthrown. So this vision uh, that I had gone into the seminar uh, expecting to pursue in in tremendous detail became less important. It was a trigger for sure, but it was this underlying uh, passage. And this is what I've come up with, thanks to my students. As we looked at these cases, this is what happens with elite-based orders. Now, when I say elite, the elite aren't simply the 1%, the notorious 1%. They are the intellectuals, the idea people, they're also the, what I call the courtier class, which we see everywhere in Washington, the people who run the institutions of governance. Now, what happens with elites every single time? The more successful the system, the stronger the elite order becomes. Elites become stratified. Politics are frozen. You see that in the Roman Empire. You can see it in the high Middle Ages with uh, feudalism and the way in which the church had a, a lock uh, on society as a whole. Uh, the elites take people and their allegiance for granted. They did this in World War I, sending uh, millions of young men to their deaths, and then again in World War II. Real social mobility declines, and it declines because elites are working relentlessly working to maximize their wealth and status. But you don't simply get a uh, growing inequality of income and wealth. You also get uh, a decline in social mobility. It's the story in each of these uh, uh, passages. Elites ignore threats to the people's way of life. They become insensitive. They don't listen. This, of course, um, was something that sneaked up uh, in this recent election. But it's happened in all of these uh, cases. People abandoned Rome. They went out in the countryside to escape the, the dominance of slavery and the poverty that they were burdened with. Um, elite authority becomes aggressively militarized toward the end in Rome and also the whole setup of feudal society 
at the height of the Middle Ages, was tremendously militarized. And the militarization, of course, characterized the 20th century. And people in the elites feel that this is civilization, and this is what needs to be protected, and this is what needs to be nurtured. And uh, though, though, those, that's not an, a straight ideological party uh, distinction. Uh, p people on the right will talk about the free market. People on the left will talk about uh, a government that is able to, to uh, regulate. And so they're both talking about the focus on civilization and not on people. The one-tenth of the one-tenth of the one percent, also known as uh, Homo Davos, Davos man. And here's the other side. And when you have such a giant uh, uh, inequality of wealth and income, the world may be getting richer, but where is the wealth going? To whom uh, 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 is it going? The militarization uh, stands out in its ability to resonate in our minds with images of medieval knights here. So, so do uh, Americans in their uh, body armor and gear. So you have a vision, but a vision that is uh, yet unfulfilled. I mean, our system has not yet come apart. And I'm not sure that we should think that it will come apart anytime soon, because the crisis comes often very slowly. The situation may build for centuries. Uh, uh, violent popular flare-ups, rebellions, uh, uh, insurgencies come and go and are viciously put down. It's only when that externality arrives, that outside force, that it tips things over. So you see, the climate change isn't the, the thing that makes it happen. It is the uh, spark plug, the, uh, the fuse, the trigger. And what happens in these crises is that elite uh, legitimacy and for a while uh, authority is overthrown and it's remade. And we can see this uh, uh, throughout the periods uh, of coming apart. The elites are overthrown. And the punchline, not the final message, but the punchline. In every single uh, system collapse or coming apart or subsidence, there is space that's opened up. There is more room for people to rise. There's more freedom. And in effect, uh, the Black Death, for example, set up the, the, the rise of Europe. The new technologies were, uh, were encouraged. They needed them. That's the innovation and new things. Uh, the physical destruction itself creates a high demand for investment and growth. So if you look at uh, writers like Thomas Piketty, you'll see how uh, the World War and then the Depression and finally World War II could be interpreted as good things because so much was destroyed, there was a pent-up demand for rebuilding, which was the economic dynamo that fueled uh, the rise of Western Europe and Japan after World War II. And in addition, there was more equality because so much wealth was destroyed. Destroyed in the Depression, but also destroyed uh, in World War I and especially World War II by the uh, coming aparts and overthrow of elites. Every uh, nation in Europe, with the exception of Britain, either suffered a revolution or was torn apart for the next 20 years, like France. What happens, and this is why the coming crisis is potentially a good thing, even if it um, leads to our tearing uh, the hair out of our heads, is that civilization is reimagined. What happens over time while the elites are stratifying and uh, corralling all this wealth unto themselves, they are also um, uh, stratifying and freezing the very civilization itself. 
And, and this is something that uh, would lead to many other stories, but it, it is something you see in late antiquity with Rome. You see it very powerfully in the, the crisis of the high Middle Ages. Uh, you see it in the 20th century. And then, when is it, when is it to come next? I put these things together uh, as, as indicators uh, uh, from my students and, and our, our conversations. And the, um, the true bottom line that I can give you and deliver it now, the bottom line message is, and, and try to keep this in mind and explore it if you're able uh, to, to face that challenge. You are the elite, and the revolution will come for you. Thank you.